Thank you so much, Luciana. It's so good having you back with us. You've been missed. Thank you. And you know what, what the praise team and she did, just saying, what him? That's not easy to do. You have to practice that, okay? So that was kind of bold on their part, and I want to thank them for, for that because it included you in, the, in the, what took place. Um, I recognize it's already 1142. I've got a choice of either shortening my message from God's word or just tell you, enjoy overtime. <laughs> okay, you just voted, oh, enjoy overtime. Okay. Um, I'm gonna invite, let, let, let me just pause for a moment and say the blessing I usually do. May the grace of God, the peace of the spirit, and the joy of the fellowship that we can have with them and with each other be with us as we begin this time looking at God's word together. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to invite three people up to help me. They don't know I'm inviting them up. I'm going to ask forgiveness later. So I'm going to ask uh, Carolina to come up and Mariah to come up and also Byron to come up. Okay? I'll explain what I'm going to do. It's... You don't have to say much, okay? All right? So while they're coming up, and grab a microphone, while they're coming up, stand up here on the platform, while they're coming up, what I'm gonna do is, I, when I was growing up, I was taught a finger play. And I taught my children that same finger play. And I don't know if they still teach it to kids or not, but some of you may remember it. And it goes like this. Here's the church, here's the steeple, open the door, what? And see all the people. It's good, but there may be a subtle misunderstanding in that little finger play. So, I'm going to ask each of you, I'll start, go from oldest to youngest. It's Monday morning. You knew it was you. It's Monday morning. Okay? And you're at work, and a colleague says, I, I don't know if you work at home or not, but you're at work. Okay. You're, you're at work, and a colleague asks you, where is your church? What would you tell them? I would tell them you couldn't get Seventh-day Adventist church. Okay. You're at work, Monday morning, where's your church? What would you tell them? I attend Laguna Niguel Church, but the church is all of us Jesus followers. Okay. What would you tell them? Um, I would say from Laguna Niguel. Laguna Niguel. Okay. Thank you. That's it. All right. When I was in school, I had a, a teacher who loved pop quizzes. Not only did he like pop quizzes, but he liked to give a pop quiz that might not be immediately answerable, or maybe partially, you could give a partial answer. If it was a partial answer, you got five points. If it was a full answer, you got 10 points. So Byron, you get five points, Mariah gets five points, and Carolina, you get 10 points, okay? What do I mean by that, okay? The facility we worship in is not the church. It's a building. You are the church. And on Sabbath, we gather to worship, and the rest of the week, we scatter to be the church wherever we are. Does that make sense? It's a subtle but very important difference as we will see in the message today. Today we are going to look at two things. First we're going to look at in Acts chapter two and I encourage you to have your Bibles open. It'll be on the screen part of the time. In fact, I forgot about the scripture reading. We're gonna read the scripture. Go ahead, Sean. With many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. They continued steadfastly in their apostles' teaching and fellowship, and the breaking of bread and in their prayers. Fear came to every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. 
They sold their property and goods and distributed them to all according to their need. And continued daily with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Thank you, Sean. Might have worked out better having the scripture then. We're going to look at two things from that passage. One is the key elements for a healthy church are found in these verses. Second, the key elements for a growing church are found in these verses. So what is, are the key elements for a healthy church in Acts 2, verses 40 to 47? Well, first of all, in Acts 2, the background is Pentecost has recently happened. It's almost like there's two parts. When you get to verse 40, it's still finishing up what took place at Pentecost when 3,000 people were saved. But it also goes on to what happens in the, the days and perhaps months afterwards. And so as we look at, at, at this, the reminder is that the first key element for a healthy church is that the healthy church is aware of the presence <laughs> The need for, the presence, and the power of the Holy Spirit in all that they do. That's it? The need for the Holy Spirit is to be present in all that we do. That's the first sign of a healthy church. And so everything else that we'll talk about has that behind it. Because without the Holy Spirit, the rest will not happen. Let's look again at Acts 2, verses 40 to 40. 42. It's from the modern English version. And I'm going to make comments on it as I read. With many other words, he, Peter, testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Now, what's interesting about that is the word testified. In the Greek, it's the word for witness. Now, when, when Peter first spoke in Pentecost, it said he said, and it used a word that talks about somebody speaking prophetically. Here it says he spoke with them many words, witnessing. I, I believe that when Peter is talking here with the many words, he's sharing with them his own encounter with Jesus. He's sharing with them what Jesus had done for him. He's sharing with them how he witnessed Jesus feeding the multitudes, how he witnessed what Jesus taught. He's sharing with them what Jesus had done for him. And he said, be saved from this perverse generation. And that, and that word perverse is used in the Old Testament in this Greek version of the times when God's people were rebellious against God. Save yourselves from this rebellious generation. And I believe Peter was also including religious leaders who had rejected Jesus. He goes on. And it says, then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And now comes the rest of the key elements. It says, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching. They continued, that, in other words, that's an ongoing thing, so this isn't just that one day. In an ongoing way, they continued, some translations say they were devoted to, but they continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching. Now, I, I want to pause for a second there. I, I think the apostles' teaching about Jesus, them following what Jesus has said, teach people to be disciples in the Great Commission and teach them everything I commanded you. I think the freshest things in their mind were the Great Commission. Take the gospel to the world. I think the freshest things in their mind were especially those, those messages that Jesus gave in the upper room on, on those last days, on that last day just before his death and resurrection. When he taught them in John 14, 15, 16, in his prayer in John 17, when he taught them that if they were going to be his disciples, they must abide in him, they must love one another, and they must bear witness or bear fruit. Because that's exactly what happens here if you read the passage carefully. And so 
it says that they're devoting themselves to the apostle teaching. Now, that would include more than just those things because it would include all of the Old Testament as Peter used the Old Testament in his sermon at Pentecost. And so they were teaching about Jesus. They were teaching about what Jesus had taught them. And so the people were continually devoted to hear what they had to say about what God wanted to do in their lives. And then it said they had fellowship. They continued in fellowship. Fellowship, no offense to the ladies who, and men who help with this, fellowship is not a fellowship dinner. It is much, much more than that. It can happen at a dinner, but fellowship is when you get together and you share together what God has done for you. You pray together as you meet needs. It is you acknowledging that God is at work in your br brother and sister's life and they acknowledge he's at work in yours. It's encouraging one another. And so the, second, the third key element, as we will see, is fellowship. And then there's the breaking of bread. Now, most commentators believe breaking of bread is referring to the Lord's Supper here. And it may be here primarily, but later it refers to it again. But I would remind you that when Jesus fed the multitude, it said he did what? He broke the bread and gave it to them. Breaking bread was a common way of stating having a meal together. And in that society, if you ate together, the belief was that when you broke the bread and you ate part of the bread and I ate part of the bread, that brought us together and made it so that we now belong to one another. And so the breaking of bread, I believe, is a symbol of belonging, acceptance. And then there's the next element, the last element, and continuing steadfastly in prayers. In prayers. This past Thursday night, the board met, and we looked at the leadership, spiritual leadership of Nehemiah. And the number one element in the spiritual leadership of Nehemiah and almost every single person who made a difference in the Bible was that they were people of prayer. That prayer was a top priority in everything they did. And so, I just want to review with you the identifying characteristics of a healthy church is they acknowledge their need and the presence of the Holy Spirit. They continually devote themselves to the apostles' teaching. And we would say also the whole Bible, but remember what Jesus said about that. He says that all of the Bible testify about who? About him. Our teaching must point people to Jesus our doctrines must point people to Jesus. It is not Jesus or doctrines. It must be Jesus and doctrines. Do you hear the point? And then it says they broke bread together. They, they functioned in such a way that they recognized they belonged to each other. And they prayed together. I want to ask you a question. To what extent do we, as the Laguna Niguel Seventh-day Adventist Church, to what extent are we aware of the Holy Spirit, our need of him and, and his presence among us? To what extent are we continually devoting ourselves to the apostles' teaching? To what extent are we continually devoting ourselves to having fellowship with each other? Or do we just come to church on Sabbath morning? To what extent... Do we have times of, of when we get, get together and break bread together and, and when we recognize the need for coming together for the Lord's Supper, do we walk away because whatever reason? And to what extent are we praying together with and for each other? To what extent is prayer a primary aspect of all that we do individually and collectively? And I would like you to ask that question of yourself, not just the church. To what extent are those five things true for you? Then we come to the part that talks about the key elements of a growing church, verses 43 to 47. And in verses 43 to 47, it says, Fear came to every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. 
most of the time when we think of wonders and signs, we think of miracles and, and raising the dead and the lame walking and all that kind of thing. Feeding the multitude. I would remind you that the greatest miracle of all is when a sinner comes to the Savior. The greatest miracle of all is when my heart is transformed to become more like Jesus. And when your heart becomes transformed to be more like Jesus. The greatest miracle of all is when people who have no business being together because of their backgrounds can fellowship and join in together with love and compassion for one another. Just this week, Sharon Custer shared that her sister, who they did not think was going to live, and prayed for her, and she came home this week. I'm not going to tell the whole story. She can tell that. But that's part of what we can t today talk about, that we need to be in awe of a God who can answer prayer and can intervene in people's lives. It goes on. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They sold their property and goods and distributed them to all according to their need. And I think sometimes we read this, we get hung up. Do I have to sell my property? I think we need to recognize what's taking place here. They only did it as they could meet the need of others in the church. They probably met the needs of others outside too. But what it's really talking about is that members were caring for one another. Members were caring for one another, whatever that mean, need might be. And then it says they continued daily with one mind in the temple. They continued to worship together with one mind. What was that one mind? I believe that one mind was they wanted to be with Jesus. They wanted to serve as Jesus served. They wanted to do what Jesus did, to become like Jesus. Their mind, their mindset was that they would continue to be Jesus to those around them. And then it goes on. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God. They ate together meals. Now, more often than not, people say this is just regular meals, not breaking of bread the Lord's Supper. I don't think it's an either or. I think it's a both and. They did have times when they just ate food. And we know that the early church, they had a agape feast where they would eat food and then they would also have communion. And, and we do it just four times a year. And sometimes people think that's maybe too much. I think it's far too little. And then it goes on. It says, and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Most Bible translations say that having favor with all the people is that the other people in some translations said they accepted them. It says, it kind of has the idea of they, they liked them, they were with them, they, they were pleased with them. And that, that's a possibility. But I think when you look at the flow of the passage, I think there's another possibility. First of all, the word favor there is really the word charis in the Greek. It means grace. They had grace with all the people. And the word with can either mean with or toward. The idea that's conveyed in most translations is that those outside had looked on the Christians favorably, but we know that that's not true of all because we knew the, know the religious leaders did not look favorably on the Christian church. And when you look at the rest of, of what it says after that, and having, let me put it this way, the Christians at that time having grace toward all the people and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Is it possible that what is being written by Luke here is telling us that when the people left their worship together, when they left their fellowship together, when they broke, after they broke bread together, as they went about their daily tasks, that they looked for ways to share God's grace with those they react, interacted with. And because of that, God was able to add to the church daily those who were being saved. Why do I think that's probably the what's meant here because it just flows better it makes more sense but I also think it goes back to the Great Commission that we talked about 
back in October. In Matthew 28, this is from the, uh, interna the International Standard Version. It says, therefore, as you go or in your going, make disciples or disciple people in all nations. Baptizing, that means immersing. Immersing them in the name or the character of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Teaching them to obey or keep in mind everything that I've commanded you. And remember, I am with you each and every day until the end of the ages. I would remind you that what he's saying here, look at the very beginning and the end. In your going, I will be with you each and every day as you disciple people and make people disciples. So the question then becomes, what is a disciple? Well, we, we like to think of the disciples as the 12 back then, right? Jesus didn't see it that way. In John 17, Jesus prayed about for the disciples. He says, I'm not just praying for the disciples who are with me. I'm also praying for those who will believe in me through their word. You are not just called to be a member of, of this church because you were baptized. You are not just called to be a Christian who believes certain things. You are called to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. What is a disciple? A disciple is a follower. Just last week as I was in uh, a church, the pastor gave a description of a disciple that I just think is the easiest and makes the most sense. He said a disciple is one who desires to be with Jesus. A disciple is one who desires to be with Jesus. He said a disciple is someone who strives to become like Jesus through the power of the Spirit. A disciple is someone who has a heart to do what Jesus did. And so the question I want to ask you this morning, the question I want to ask you is, do you desire to be with Jesus? Do you desire to be like, come like Jesus? Are you willing to do what Jesus did to seek and to save the lost? There's one common obstacle we have in our society today. And that's that we kind of believe that my faith my faith is personal. It's between me and God. And therefore, we kind of wait for people to come to us. I'll never forget in a Sabbath school class in Corona, someone said, it's wrong for me to go out and witness. I just live my life and I wait for them to come to me. That's not what God asks of us. I have a quote I want to read. Because we are called to go out and minister to those around us. It's from Bruce Milne in the, his commentary on the Acts of Apostles. He says, The New Testament, no less than the Old, knows nothing of solitary religion. Individual personal faith is no doubt necessary to appropriate God's gift of Jesus Christ and to be the vehicle of God's gracious salvation in each recipient's heart. But the act of God in saving us immediately and eternally sets us in the community of the Spirit, the body of Christ, comprising all those in every place and in every time who own him as Lord. Our faith must bring us together. You see, faith, yes, it is personal, but it is never private. Our faith is personal, but never private. Because people are watching. People are listening. You can have an impact on people. You may wonder about the title of the message today. Time to gather and be scattered. We cannot fulfill those elements of a healthy church if we are not worshiping together. And worshiping together is best done when we are together here in person. Fellowship is best done when we are here together 
in person or when we meet together in person in small groups or whatever. Praying, yes, we pray individually, but praying as a church is best done when we are together. As we think about our society today, we must admit that we cannot do church as we've always done it, in terms, not in terms of worship, but in terms of how we reach out to those who need to know Jesus. It's time for us to gather together so that as we scatter and on Monday morning someone asks, where is the church that you show up? You show up through listening. You show up through through being open to talk to them about your own relationship with God. And we'll, we'll cover that in the, in the sermon next week somewhat. I'm not, just not going to tell you to go out and do it and not give you some tips on how you can. But Dan Greer, in a book titled, um, a book that's titled Christianity in the, for the 21st Century, Gathered and Scattered, he makes the following observation. The following observation. When you live in a Judeo-Christian America, he's talking past tense, and all that comes with it, you can successfully use an attractional model to reach people. By that, it means you try to attract them into the church. You can invite them to an evangelistic crusade, spring revival, vacation Bible school, and world-class Christian progr children's programming, and they will likely come. But the spiritual value chain has changed. Our culture is now postmodern, post Christian, and heavily influenced by the often toxic nature of the internet that attacks biblical truth on every front. Now, an attractional model will no longer be effective because those who do not identify with any faith are not coming to hear the great new sermon series you are pushing on social media. You must radically transform to an intentionally relational approach at work and in your neighborhood at work and in your neighborhood he also has another quote which I skipped over but I want to come to it now he says the real biblical mistake Christians make is that the primary work of gospel proclamation is placed upon church organizational culture instead of upon individual Christians, where they live, work, and play. The front lines of the gospel have moved from the churches we attend to the neighborhoods where we live and the places where we work. Jesus wants you to be his hands and feet in your spheres of influence. He, it is time for us to not just be a church when we gather together, but it's time for us in the day and age in which we live to be the church gathers, that gathers together, the church that scatters, that we might refer and relate people to Jesus so that they can experience what a healthy church experiences, a church that is empowered by the Holy Spirit, a church that cares for one another when times of need, a church that worships together, a church that enjoys being together, and a church that spends time with people listening to their needs. And I can already hear people saying, but Pastor Gary, I'm old. God still can use you. I can hear someone saying, Pastor Gary, I'm too young. God still can use you. Remember two weeks ago when Mateo prayed? And you all sat there, if you were here, and his witness in his prayer moved and touched your lives. If he can do it, you can do it too. There is no excuse for us to just simply live our lives as if it's only about us. We are called to be empowered by the Spirit. We are called to care for one another. We're called to worship together. We're called to enjoy being together in fellowship and we're called to spend time with others so that God can add daily to those who are becoming part of his family.